Well, first of all, I apologize to you both that you don't get to sit on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> They took the bet away. But uh, look, you heard the first panel uh, this afternoon uh, where they said that businesses are starting to get interested in design, but they don't do it very well. Now, I hope in the next 30 minutes we're going to solve that problem. You're going to tell them how to do it. Uh, but let's start with the first, first part. In, in your experience at McKinsey and, and in the companies that you've looked at and consulted with, is there a big change here in the way design is treated? Well, in our research, I guess we've been doing research at the Darden School at UVA for about eight years now, looking at the movement of, dare I say, design thinking uh, into- <laughs> you're, you're okay with that term. I'm okay with that term, okay. right? I, 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 was, uh, I was saying, Alan, I, I think the first thing we could do to improve the uptake of design in business would be to get rid of the thinly veiled contempt for the people who work in the organization. But uh, other than uh, that- No offense meant to anyone. Not at all, okay. not at all. <laughs> uh, but we see design thinking uh, being used uh, and creating valuable results in organizations from startups to global corporations from hospitals uh, to schools. Really, almost anywhere we look, we're seeing a proliferation of these tools being put in the hands of employees at every level of the organization. And why? Well, I think I would say, in my view, um, it's because nobody owns innovation. I mean, design is a route to innovation. We don't care about design in and of itself, at least in business organizations. We care about design because it allows us to create better value for people. Value is not necessarily measured by novelty either in a business context. So what we're seeing design thinking allow is people at the front lines of organizations, for instance, who are the, one, the teacher who goes into her classroom. Right? Instead of waiting for the superintendent to pronounce a grand innovation improvement strategy, he or she can go in and make lives better for the 20 kids in her class the next day using these techniques. And I think that's the, that's the promise of, of design. It, it can do, I think, for innovation, what total quality management did for the quality movement. Derek, what about the second part of the, the proposition the earlier panel gave us, which was, yeah. Wow. That's Oops. why they tell you not to rotate the chairs. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That is, a, that is a very poorly designed little table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I'm, so, I'm the Chevy Chase of the group. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second part of the, the proposition that that panel came up with, which was, yeah, companies get that it's important, but they're not very good at it. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's a maturity process, and um, lots of companies are willing to take a flyer on this, right? You know, design thinking as a conversation has been around 17, 18 years, and even before that, I think there were definitely cases available where they could see that design was an effective differentiator. Um, the problem is knowing what investments to make, how to measure success, you know, how to support the team the right way. And I think uh, everything from some things I think we talked about at this conference last year around businesses solve problems in a very different way than design teams do. And like making those teams work together and take advantage of that, those different problem solving methods isn't easy. Uh, and, and they will tend to fail in doing that. I think that also finding the right talent to execute both on the design side and in the other functions of the business to have to work with designers. So let's drill down on that a little bit. Both of you have now referred to the, the difficulty of getting the designer culture and the corporate culture working together. How do you do it, Gene? Well, for me, the opportunity of the, the toolkit of design thinking, it kind of brings its own methodology for talking across difference. I think as much as we talk about design as though the major outcome was just improved products and, and quality of experiences, for me, design is really a social technology. It's a way to talk across difference. And uh, I think what we know is that difference and diversity of perspectives is the route to breakthrough thinking. But all of that difference, when we try and talk to each other, ends up in debates that go nowhere. It's hard. It's hard. And I think most of us argue out of our own expertise. And so when we put different people in the room with different expertise, they find it very difficult uh, to keep the conversation from deteriorating into a, into a battle of wills and our expertise. And I think what design teaches us is if we can focus on a common definition of the problem, if we can identify a set of stakeholders whose needs we're trying to meet, and then if we can immerse ourselves in their experiences to come up with a set of criteria that's driven by them, not by our own area of expertise, then we can align 
and we can begin to put together the value of all that. So the design thinking actually helps you break through the bureaucracy. I believe it can. You buy that, Derek? I mean, do you have maybe you yeah. could give us a good example of someone who's actually mm -hmm. demonstrated that. No, I, I think it can actually help, and I, it, it comes back to you know I think thinking about design thinking. It's not Six Sigma. It's not a process like that, right? And if you try to employ it that way, I think part of the problem is you're not necessarily getting the right expertise onto the team to do it. Some people hear about design thinking and then try to do it without designers. And I think that's where you run into a lot of problems. But you know, having that at least open the conversation to address a, a couple of the main issues. I think one, most business problems within the business context are solved you know, via reductionist methods, whereas design solutions being more generative creates a natural tension in the organization. People have to understand how to recognize that and how to take advantage what of it. Would elaborate on that. What do you mean reductionist methods versus so regenerative? When you go through a business school program or you work at a big business consulting firm, you're, you're taught to the first step in the problem solving process is to identify every possible solution. And then the work plan you build is how to eliminate potential solutions so you get to the best solution standing. So you need to have all the ideas on day one and you measure progress by how quickly you can eliminate answers. Not command. A design team working in parallel, they're going to spend a lot of time building context and, and immersing themselves in the problem. So while the business function is listing out all these potential solutions, they can't get any ideas from the design team because they haven't fully immersed themselves yet, which is okay. They just need to recognize that. Is, yeah, is there, that's really interesting. Is there an inherent conflict between the way business has been taught and practiced and uh, uh, an iterative design process, Gene, do you think? Do you oh, have I that problem? Oh, I think absolutely. That, that's both the promise of design and also the challenge of actually incorporating it. Um, almost any large organization, at least, has been optimized for efficiency. That's how we're taught to think. What is the most efficient path from here to there? To someone with that mindset, design looks incredibly inefficient. Right? We're going to spend all this time mucking around with the problem, and, and the N is small, so we're not even going to have quantitative data when we're done. And then once I found a good solution, you're trying to tell me that I actually need a whole portfolio of solutions, and I have to go out and experiment when I'm pretty sure that I've already got a great one. I mean, everything about it just looks like I'm wasting my time, when in reality, we know that if you're willing to invest that time in the front end, in the end, you'll have a superior scalable solution. So how do you convince a bunch of business people of that? You really have to have some, some metrics that prove the point you just made, don't you, Gene? Well, I, I think there's two pieces to it, right? I think one, you know, kind of one of the tenets of talking about design thinking is to talk about it being participatory. And I think the, the companies I've worked with that have done this well, you know, they create space for everyone in the organization to have a role. Uh, I think you know, it requires the same empathy skills that designers bring to understanding users and understanding those problems, using it to understand their internal clients or their peers in the organization. You know, what are their capabilities? What can they bring to the table? What are going to be their hangups? And, and how can I let them experience part of the design process, not trying to turn them into a designer, but letting them participate to an extent that they can see why that's a great answer. They can understand the qualitative side a bit more. And then I do believe that also there is a set of metrics you can build, or at, at a minimum, a definition of good. Uh, a lot of companies that try to experiment with design, they become their own worst enemy because they don't know what good design is. And there's all kinds of failure modes associated with that. It's taking way too many turns, too many iterations. They use testing as a, as a distraction from actually making decisions. Other times, it's all around you know, kind of certain key individuals expressing an opinion as a focus group of one rather than getting broad feedback. And I think getting to a definition of what good design is, what impact from design is, is critical to evaluating the impact yeah. it can have the organization. You know, I had a fascinating conversation at lunch with Mauro Porcini. I, I don't know where he is. And I I'll probably botch his story. I'm sorry he didn't get to tell it himself, but about the labels that Pepsi has made for life water, that using uh, local artists, and they swap, they, they'll uh, focus on three at a time, and they'll swap them out every three months. But as you can imagine, introduces a whole bunch of complexity into the bottling of water. Um, um, and so I said, how did you, how were you able to get it done? And he said, well, it helped that we were sponsored by the CEO. So how important is it in your experience that the, the CEO personally be involved and that there be somebody in the C-suite who is driving the process? I think it depends upon your definition of success. Uh, certainly, we, we know that any significant change benefits from top-down leadership. There's no argument about that, about that. But in our research, we see all kinds of really motivating stories about people who get excited about the potential of design, they take a course on Coursera, 
right? They learn some of the basic techniques. And then without waiting for permission, they just go out and do it, right? And when you get enough of those kind of design champions waging their own little guerrilla warfare about design and getting results, people start to notice, like you said earlier, Derek. So yes, I don't think anyone's going to turn down a senior leader who says, I'm going to give you my full backing. But I certainly wouldn't wait for one, because we see people really having an impact in the world they can impact without waiting for permission from the top. Did either of you train in design? So I, I went to graduate school in industrial design before joining McKinsey. And, and how important is that, do you think? How critical is the formal training? Did, uh, Gene, you? Yeah. I am an accountant by training, so I like to go. say that I am design accountant. I am the least broadly educated person you will ever meet. <laughs> so so I, I'll, I'll give you the same context I share with my own teams internally. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of work within design within McKinsey and with our uh, acquisitions we made in the design space, like Lunar. In each one of those equations, I consider myself the business stiff in that conversation. Even having a bit of a background in design, I came up through McKinsey and you know, kind of learned the consulting side and building uh, strategy and doing other operational work. And I bring that lens to our design work. I don't come in and because I have a degree and say, I, I'm here to be a designer and lead the team. I have an enormous respect for the people. Uh, a lot of conversations earlier today, we've heard about the craft. Right? I think that's something that has to be part of an effective piece of design work, you know, you need that expertise. You need people that really know how to draw insights out of observations. You can't have people just doing this part time. You need people that can really craft, you know, great holistic solutions, but they also need people that can understand their work and bring that back into the business. So, you know, a lot of the current business interest in design and design thinking traces itself back to Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's now the most valuable company in the world. Uh, people talk about how the, the iPod was, uh, there were MP3 players around long before the iPod, but the iPod cracked the design. But Gene, you've written that we really need to get away from the kind of Steve Jobs approach to design. Can you talk well, about that? I guess part of it is, what is the rest of the organization supposed to do with their time while we wait for the next Steve Jobs to appear? <laughs> I mean, we just, we talk to person after person who's, who's off in search of, I want the next iPhone uh, uh, equivalent in my industry. And you say, well, you know, how about just improving 10% the experience of the customers you've already got, right? What if, what if you multiplied? We, we have one of the stories that we've cataloged is, uh, is out of the US Health and Human Services uh, area who started offering any employee anywhere in the country who's got an idea, design thinking, training, and support. One young quality control officer in an Apache Indian reservation came up with an idea to reduce wait times in the hospital that she worked at, which were as long as eight hours. Right. It's estimated that what, uh, what she's come up with, which is not novel and it's not radical, but it's radical to that hospital, right, will actually save that hospital millions of dollars a year. Now multiply that by 80,000 employees. If just a fraction of them were empowered to go off and do this kind of work, we'd be looking at big numbers. But instead, we ignore that. We say, oh, we only want big, disruptive, novel things. And we ignore the opportunity that's right there to engage the other 99% of the organization in creating better value for the people they serve. Part of the jobs mythology is also this notion that uh, you know, he, didn't, he didn't want focus groups. He didn't want data. He wanted to come, you know, he knew better than the customer did what the customer was going to like. <laughs> Uh, is that helpful? You know, it's it, it, much like the, the visionary model in the first place. It's pretty unsustainable. Um, in certain industries, that can work for a while, right? Like, you know, if, if I'm creating consumer packaged food products and my family eats, I have my own set of insights. And if I'm empathetic and I kind of talk to enough people in my own perspective, can be a pretty valuable tool in that design exercise. The problem is, as you're successful, you tend to kind of depart more from being the common consumer and being this weird hybrid you know, of kind of working in the space, knowing the technology, knowing the field. And, and if you continue designing for yourself rather than the people that actually exist, that, that differentiation from the market eventually will create products that nobody wants. You know, so you have to have a good mechanism to make sure you bring user feedback in. In other industries, you're just obviously not a good proxy for that. I'm not going to you know, kind of tell exact, a neurosurgeon exactly the next tool he needs to do brain surgery. I'm going to rely on observations and understand that. And if I just tried to be a focus group of one for that, I'm sure I'd get sued. So, I was going to say, to me, you know, it's, it's kind of 
uh, I think of it as the Moses myth, right? There, are, there is this small category of truly genius individuals who can kind of stand by the Red Sea and raise their staff to God, and mysteriously, he or she speaks to them and parts the waters. Right? And, and I, I don't think we want to deny the enormous power that those people have to change an industry. On the other hand, you can build a bridge. Right? And, and I think uh, for the rest of the organization, what design thinking allows you to do is systematically build a bridge and, instead of all like raising our staffs powerlessly to God, waiting for a miracle to occur. It's not an either or situation. We can do both. We can honor the creative geniuses. And we can build systems and processes so that everyone gets to have a role in this important work. I add just one thing to that too. I think a related concept um, that I find a lot of discussions with clients these days is you know, going back to innovation, what's the role of design versus technology? And a you know, significantly higher number of our clients are very technology led in their innovation process and design is a bit of an afterthought. And I think people think of this as an all or nothing switch. You know, I have to stop doing technology led and then move you know, 100% into design led and get the huge design win. But I think these two things are actually incredibly complementary. You know, there's going to be times when there isn't a new technology. You know, so development fails or you don't have the next big idea, but you have to continue reinventing the business. And having design led innovation as a complement to new technologies to really flesh out your portfolio, not every one of them has to be a home run, yeah. but a steady diet of singles and doubles can have an enormous impact on the innovation and like create, filling the space between some of the bigger ideas. Yeah, I think not only that, we, we, we've been working lately with NASA, uh, who when they first called us, uh, the people who are, are behind the Mars mission and said, we'd like to use design thinking and train our scientists, we think it would be useful. Uh, I said to them, well, I'm the world's biggest advocate of design thinking, but honestly, isn't getting to Mars a technical problem? I don't see how design <laughs> thinking is going to help you. It's how you get there that matters. And what he said is, it's a technical problem that we know we can solve because we have the best scientists in the world, but they can't talk to each other. And all of the solutions happen in the white space between their specialties. So if you can use design thinking to get them talking, they will come up with the technology breakthrough. I mean, every technology has human beings working with it, right? And so we need a social technology, a way of talking to complement the super technology. Well, 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 that's fascinating. I mean, this is obviously the, the curse of every big organization, right? It's the, it be, it be, the silos develop, the silos become hardened, it becomes more difficult for people to communicate between the silos. Are, are, do, do both of you see design as, a, as an answer to that, as a way of bringing the organization, make the organization function again? I, I think there's enormous power in design to play that integrator role. Um, you know, there's some intrinsic skills with you know kind of the people that work in design and around the type of work that make them a little bit better at it. But it's also just a vacuum of leadership in the organization that design is actually well equipped to address. You know, I'm really excited by the conversations I'm hearing out of the design community around taking your empathy lens and putting it on your own organization, around taking on the role of educator within your organization and teaching them how design works, how they work together. Um, but I think that toolkit is particularly applicable to solving so the, the silo issue. The, the chief design officer or whoever it is becomes the driver of cultural change within the organization. I, I think you have to drive cultural change to be a chief design officer in the first place. So doing it outside of your own sphere can be valuable. You look a little skeptical. Yeah, well, you know, I guess for me, it, 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 our research suggests that design and being involved in that innovation conversation doesn't just change the experience of the person you're designing for. It changes your relationship with the people you're designing with. And I think when we look at this paradox of difference, um, if, if we're not designing with people who are different internally in the organization, we've got no way to escape the blinders of kind of the narrow view that our expertise gives us. So the more we can use design to change and invite and engage a different group of people in the conversation, the more the culture will change by itself. Right? And I think when we look for the impact of design thinking. Again, one of the frustrating things from a business perspective is a lot of the stuff you care most about, the most powerful impacts of design thinking happen below the surface. They're not easy to quantify and measure. It's the way it changes the mindsets of the people that are involved. It's the way it changes the relationship. It's the way it changes the conversation. And I think it's hard to appreciate the power of changing the conversation to change the culture. 
um, if you don't see it firsthand. Well, the measurement part of this is really, really important. If you know, you talk about IBM hiring a thousand designers. Obviously, the question that the CEO is going to ask or the board is going to ask is, what's the return on that investment? How do you show the return on investment of this uh, uh, design approach? Well, it's a, a question you know, very personal to me because doing acquisitions in the design space within a consulting firm, I get the same question from, from my partners. partners. They say, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You spend our money on what and how are we getting a return <laughs> on this? Right? So I think there, there is a conversation on, on, on the quant side to say you know, kind of what is our expectation for growth and financial impact and like how do we actually measure that. Uh, but there's other things that you know, we've, we've had a great dialogue about getting credit for to kind of evaluate success within the organization. Uh, a lot, you know, our recruiting team is really excited about our moves in design because they find it's a lot easier to attract young talent, feeling like they are, we are now a more innovative organization hmm. for bringing design in in such a visual way. You know, there's a lot of ways that we're having conversations with our clients that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And you have to find a way to include that in some type of scorecard to evaluate design because it's, it, not everything can be easily quantified. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the findings of this last bit of research we've just done on the use of design thinking in the US government space is that the people who are most likely to get excited about design thinking and run with it are the ones who are least likely to hang around and try and measure the outcomes, <laughs> right? I mean, that makes sense in some level. It's the change agents. It's, and if I can take my time and go help one more person versus demonstrate, you know, document what I just did, not help anybody, I'll tell you every time where they're gonna go. So, so I think it's interesting. We know that demonstrating results requires the careful design of experiments, right? I mean, we've got pre-tests, post-tests, we've got control groups, we've got a whole bunch of stuff <coughs> that designers just aren't that interested in doing generally. So I think when we look at how you find partners in the space, to help you do that documentation, to help you think about measurement issues before you intervene, not afterwards. I think those are the kind of partnerships where people who are more data-driven can bring a very rich dimension to the conversation. To the designers. Uh, any questions or comments from the group? Uh, anyone have a, yes, right here, please. Where are the microphones? Can Hang on just one second. Uh, please stand up so the camera can catch you and identify yourself. Uh, sure. My name is Blake Perez. I'm from the SUTD MIT International Design Center. Um, the question earlier today was, where do we find this design talent, right? <laughs> and McKinsey's approach is, let's go and find an organization full of wonderfully talented people and invite them in. Um, but with doing that, you don't get to grow your design competency organically from within. You don't bake it into the recipe. So I'm curious about the problems and potentially the solutions that you've come up with with taking such a large organization with perhaps a very different culture and making it mesh together. Yeah, so I, I think maybe to dispel a little bit of the myth, I, we have done some acquisitions, but you know, um, we probably have over 400 designers and engineers right now, and less than a third of those kind of came via M&A or Aquahire. So we have done a lot of organic building efforts, and actually on the digital side predated you know, investments in Lunar and things like that. Um, yeah, I think there's advantages in both approaches. Um, you know, doing a, a lift out of a team that knows how to work together, obviously builds a little bit of culture that can keep that team together excited and, and ready to run, uh, but it also is harder to integrate into the organization. Uh, bringing people in organically, you have to give them a structure and, and you know, kind of a way that they can fit in and, and integrate. Um, the biggest you know, things that we've had to spend time on is you know, really fleshing out a a professional development model and a conversation we can have with people both before we bring them in and after about how they're gonna get better by working with us, how they're gonna get opportunities they wouldn't have elsewhere, and then delivering that promise in you know, kind of twice a year conversations so they can see their own personal change and their benefit of being part of the team. Um, we're just about out of time, but if I can ask you both quickly, yep. single best advice for companies trying to integrate design and design thinking into their business processes, Gene. I would say a design is teachable and scalable, and you have the opportunity to invite every single person in the organization into the conversation in ways that will make a difference. So inclusiveness. Inclusiveness and training, I think, and support from the experts who know it well. I don't think it's an either or whether we go outside and bring and find talented people who know how to do this as the experts, or whether we grow our own. I think it works best when we have both. Do, do it both. Derek, best advice. Uh, I think Eric Kent at 3M has a phrase he calls a collaborative creativity. And I think that there's a, a lot embedded in that, but I think the biggest lesson that people can learn and you see you can't 
expect design to come up with all the answers for you. You can expect them to be a tool, a facilitator. They can help you through a process and help the whole team get to a better answer. But nobody gets to you know, kind of lose responsibility for coming up with the next big thing. Great. Thank you, Derek. Thank Gene, you. Thanks very much.